Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome to today's live presentation entitled Human Pluripotent Stem Cells in Understanding Genetic Cardiovascular Disease and Effects of Drugs. I'm Roland Leathers from Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I'll be your moderator. Before we begin, we want to point out that you can submit questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found in the lower left-hand corner of the presentation window. We'll answer as many questions as we can following the presentation. I would now like to introduce you to today's speaker, Christine Mummery. Christine is Chair of Anatomy and Embryology and Professor of Developmental Biology at Leiden University Medical Center. Her research concerns the cardiovascular development and disease models based on human pluripotent stem cells. Immediate interests are on developing biophysical techniques for characterization and functional analysis of cardiovascular cells from HPSCs. In 2015, she became guest professor at the Technical University of Twente to develop organ-on-chip models. Dr. Mummery is a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Science, is on the board of the Netherlands Medical Research Council, and holds a European Research Council advanced grant to study cardiac development and disease in humans based on stem cell models. She is editor-in-chief of Stem Cell Reports, the journal of the International Society of Stem Cell Research. She is also on the editorial boards of Cell, Stem Cell, Cardiovascular Research, and Stem Cells. Please join me in welcoming Christine Mummery. Over to you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak. So to get us all on the same page, I'm going to just give a brief introduction to stem cells. And as we all know, there are various kinds of stem cells. So we have had for many years embryonic stem cells derived from human embryos. We know they can grow indefinitely and can form all cells of the body. These cells, these deri differentiated derivatives are all immature, so they re resemble their fetal origins, the cells in the fetus, and it's one of the shortcomings of these types of models. Next to these, we have adult stem cells, the most widely known being hemopoietic stem cells, which we've known for more than 30 years as existing in bone marrow. But uh, of, of more recent years, it's been, become clear that adult tissues also harbor a stem cell population. And a pioneer in that area has been Hans Klavers, who discovered, mostly in cells of the gastrointestinal tract, that there is an adult stem cell population, and these could grow in suspension as what he called organoids. And these have been derived from many different tissues. The advantage of these cells is particularly that not only that they can grow indefinitely, but they form rather more mature cells in culture. But they do only form the epithelial components of the organs, so they don't form the stroma, they don't form the blood vessels. So in cases where you might be wanting to model uh, more complex diseases in which the stroma or blood vessels play a role, these are the shortcomings of these cells. And finally, uh, whilst these are also, the adult stem cells are generally not ethically sensitive, the embryonic stem cells are because of their origins. But we've had uh, for the last uh, 10 years now induced pluripotent stem cells that can be derived by reprogramming somatic cells so we can get them from urine, from blood, from skin. Any somatic cell in your body um, can be reprogrammed to a pluripotent state, which we now understand is essentially not different from embryonic stem cells, um, and the cells can form all parts of your body. So where we are together in, in this field now is we have uh, embryonic stem cells, um, which um, can be de derived from um, diseased uh, embryos, and there's a, a bank of these, in, um, particularly at iSTEM in Paris, um, where they have some 400 diseased lines. The disadvantage of these lines is they've been derived from embryos, so we never will know from which individual they were derived, how bad the disease might have been, what would have been the onset, age of onset of the disease, and to which drugs or otherwise the uh, cells or the person would have responded to. And that's where uh, iPS cells have an advantage. So they're derived from diseased or healthy individuals, and we know a lot about their medical history. If they have a disease, we will know when they would have developed it probably, and to which drugs they might have responded, and to which ethnic group uh, they might have belonged, because not all diseases affect all ethnic groups in the same way. 
Now, with these sources of stem cells, of course, the initial idea was to use them for regenerative medicine, produce cells that have been destroyed in disease, and then uh, use these cells as a source to replace that tissue. But it's turned out that that's been extremely difficult. And now where we see the most um, applications are in disease modeling. Um, we can get them from patients with genetic diseases and have been able to see disease phenotypes in pharmacological screening. Um, we can look for drugs using these models that uh, can be used to correct the issue in the stem cell derivatives and also perhaps be given to the patients. And we can also use them for toxicity studies. So we can see which drugs or compounds might be toxic to particular cell types in the body. So what are the problems we're trying to address in, in terms of the broader range of medical applications? One of the problems is there's no drugs for many chronic diseases. We just don't know how to treat them. We also know that where there are drugs for some diseases, the drugs don't work on all patients, and we don't know why. And a, a third important issue is that drug side effects are still the fourth leading cause of death. So cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, and car accidents or motor accidents are quite high, but still the fourth leading cause of death is um, side effects of drugs. And why is this? Well, there's poor insight into human disease mechanisms. We know a lot about how a disease develops in mice, but in the uh, human equivalents, we really uh, are not very clear about this. There's a lack of personalized predict treatment prediction. We don't know why some individuals um, react to a drug or develop a disease in a certain way. And because mouse strains are inbred, we will never find it out from mice. And animals are poorly predictive of humans. And most particularly, this is most notable for the heart. The mouse heart beats at 500 times a minute and doesn't react to stress. A human heart, 60, does react strongly to stress by beating fast. The immune system in, in mice or other animals is very different from that in humans. In all of the years sepsis has been studied, there's no drug yet developed that can treat it because of the differences in the immune system. The brain is quite different in most species than from humans. There are parts of the brain affected in humans by disease which don't exist in mice. The reproductive system is very different, and even things just because of diet, the stomach is different. So there are many differences between animals and humans. And if we look at uh, how um, induced pluripotent stem cells particularly have been able to contribute or potentially contribute to this area, we, if, we, if we look at the publications pu published over the last several years on disease modeling or deriving IPS lines from particular patients, we can see this has um, exploded. So this uh, is a list uh, given on a yearly basis of which types of IPS cells have been derived. They've been divided up into the neural, the cardiac, uh, the organoid-like structures, the endoderm and mesoderm. And you can see in 2008, the first publication came from George Daly's lab um, deriving uh, IPS cells from a patient. And you can see these are all of the publications, let's say, in 2015. So this is an exploding area. People see, are beginning to see the value of doing this. So, but there are challenges, and we shouldn't uh, deny those challenges because many of us uh, are working on them. There still is line-to-line -line variability, even clone-to-clone -clone variability between IPS cells, and we don't know really why that is, but the better our protocols are getting, the less the line-to-line -line variability has uh, become evident. Directed differentiation to the required cell types. We've realized over the, particularly with the work on embryonic stem cells, that it's slightly more difficult than we thought. Um, we thought once we'd got a beating cell or once we got a neuron, that was it. But we only then realized we might need all the different subtypes of cells in a particular organ to mimic a disease. And there's still a lot of work going on in that area. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the maturation of the differentiated cells is an issue. Very few studies have managed to get these cells to go beyond mid-gestation in fetal development, yet if you're trying to model a disease that appears in adult, you really do want the adult equivalent. And in some cases, it doesn't particularly matter if all the genes, the relevant genes are expressed at the fetal stage, but in some cases, we certainly will want mature cells. 
And their genetic stability is also um, still an existing issue. Um, we don't really know how to maintain this long term, even though they're essentially immortal. And when genetic changes occur, we don't actually know how it affects our phenotype. So there's a lot of areas of research to be carried out to make this a really robust area. So the solutions have been sought in defined culture conditions. This has helped enormously getting away from serum-based uh, variability, batch-to-batch -batch variability, and the um, effects of using defined conditions have uh, increased the efficiency of um, getting different cell types through differentiation enormously. We are also developing complex and multicellular uh, engineered tissues. It turns out that cells uh, like to have the right sort of neighbors next to them. And by remixing and creating complex disease models, we seem to be getting more uh, mature tissues. And what we've re realized of late, physical constraints and stimuli do affect the cells. If we think specifically of the heart, stretch and strain is, is something that's going on throughout your whole life. And our beating cells on a plastic substrate are just beating spontaneously. They're not undergoing stretch and strain. And if we think of uh, other cells and tissues and organs, let's say the vasculature, there's blood flow over the top of the endothelial cells, um, and they will also respond differently. So there's many physical uh, stimuli that are important for cells. So in the case of the heart, uh, cyclic stretch and strain may help maturation. Electrical or optogenetic pacing is a way to go, which is being tried in many labs. Fluid flow, although fluid might not flow directly over um, the cardiomyocytes, it certainly will uh, flow through the adjacent capillaries, and these cells might, might make a difference. Also, using different energy sources could be important. You probably know that most of your medium contains very high levels of glucose. And that's typical of a fetal situation. The fetus receives a lot of high glucose uh, nutrients. But at birth, when babies start drinking milk, uh, their energy source turns to fatty acids. And we don't take uh, much notice of that in our culture media. And we also might like to add different hormones uh, and growth factors that also switch very rapidly at birth. So that these are all avenues uh, to explore to see whether we can Im improve the maturation state. So when we differentiate uh, cells, um, we recapitulate the events of development. And this is what most protocols do. Whichever cell type you're um, doing, um, you, uh, you, you, you follow the differentiation. So if we're trying to make uh, cardiomyocytes, and you can see those at, uh, at day 14 on the extreme right beating away, we first need to make mesoderm. And we need a bunch of growth factors to do that. They're listed between days 0 and 3 on the top of the screen. Um, and if you uh, then wait till they form early mesoderm, you need to get them to switch into nascent cardiac mesoderm and then become patterned to form cardiomyocytes. The same is true for, let's say, if we want to make endothelial cells. These are another very important uh, cell type for all organs. Every uh, organ is vascularized. There's 60,000 kilometers of vasculature in your body. So these are really important cells. Again, to make vascular endothelial cells and pericytes, which are the surrounding cells, we first need to uh, get them to form mesoderm. And then once they form mesoderm, we add in a number of growth uh, factors, the most important being VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. We add that in and uh, um, we refresh the medium. And on day 10, we have uh, an epithelial-like looking population, which we can sort out into two, two cell types. We can sort out the CD31 positive cells. That's also called PCAM. And you can see uh, in this top uh, row here that we've done some staining here of the CD31 positive cells. You can see they're positive for PCAM. They're also positive for V-coherin. And they also express von Willebrand factor, which is very ca characteristic of endothelial cells. So, but when we look at the CD31 uh, negative population, they're quite an interesting cell type too. So if they were smooth muscle cells, and that's what's normally surrounding vessels, they would express two proteins, that is culponin and SM22. And you can see here that these cells, uh, when we get them as CD31 positives, positive cells, don't express these proteins. 
But if we add in two growth factors, TGF-beta and PDGF, you can see here they switch on uh, calponin-1 and SM22, which means we're seeing a switch from pericytes into smooth muscle cells. Now, the interesting thing there is that this is exactly what happens uh, in the, uh, in the uh, vasculature. So if we make uh, from pluripotent stem cells, we make endothelial cells, and I'm showing them here in green. You can see them here. And we uh, get the CD31 negative cells, which we could call pericytes here, and we mix them together, we can get structures looking like this. So this is um, a mixture of the CD31 positive and negative cells. The green ones are the endothelial cells marked with PCAM. The red ones are the SM22 um, positive cells. And the blue ones are the uh, cells which are far away from the endothelial cells. And what we believe has happened here is the blue ones are the pericytes still, the, the pericytes adjacent to the green endothelial cells have received TGF-beta and PDGF from the endothelial cells and have made the switch from a pericyte into a smooth muscle, which is why you see them hanging around the endothelial cells in that picture. Now, we know that for this interaction, notch signaling is really important. So the interaction between pericytes and endothelial cells is mod modulated or mediated by notch. So if we add um, uh, a factor in, uh, gamma secretase inhibitor, that we add it into these cold cultures, done exactly the same uh, as on the left, what we see is very few of the red cells. And that, what that means is by inhibiting notch, we prevent the pericytes interacting with the green endothelial cells, and they don't make the switch into smooth muscle cells. Now, if you were trying to do this with primary cells, the cells you'd get out of the body, the, the, the pericytes, would immediately in culture turn into smooth muscles. So this is a unique um, event you can model very well with iPS cells. And why is this relevant? Now, there's a genetic disease called Cadacil, which is uh, caused by a mutation in the notch gene. And what these patients have is very weak uh, blood vessels. So now we know from this type of study that's because they are unable to recruit the pericytes adequately to the smooth muscles, uh, to, the, to the vasculature, their vessels as a result are not stable and are easily uh, able to hemorrhage. So these people are very susceptible to uh, small strokes, which can actually lead to dementia. So this is a, a very nice model based on this disease. But the point to make here is if you did not have both cell types present, you would see no phenotype. So if we'd only looked at the endothelial cells and had assumed the hemorrhage was caused by an, a defect in the endothelial cells, we would have seen nothing in this model. So this uh, takes me to the next point, which actually shows um, many of the genes that uh, uh, mediate the interaction between smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, and as shown here, astrocytes uh, in, in the brain. So this is a sort of model of the blood-brain barrier. And you can see all of the genes that are important in these interactions. And for many of these diseases, mutation in any of these diseases cause uh, specific diseases. So you can see them listed on the right-hand side. These are diseases caused by uh, failure for proper interaction between these cell types. And again, if you want to model these uh, diseases, you have to show these particular cell, uh, you have to have these particular cell types present. An important point, though, is I showed you we could make pericytes and, and endothelial cells, but of course it's not quite that simple. It turns out that every organ in the body has its own type of endothelial cell. And we also know that there are at least seven different uh, developmental origins of pericytes, so they're not all the same. If we look at this, uh, this uh, figure here, this is a, a, a model. It demonstrates the kind of conditions that can arise, it, let's say, in diabetes. You see uh, here the vasculature of the kidney and here the vasculature of the eye. Now, this is uh, what you see uh, for the eye is that the pericytes or the vascular smooth muscle cells are very uh, open, so they don't cover the whole vessel entirely. Yet for the kidney, 
the, the whole vessel is completely covered by these smooth muscle cells. So even in a single individual, depending on the organ, the pericytes and endothelial cells will behave differently. So it's quite important to get the right type of endothelium and the right t uh, to interact with the right type of cell. I'm going to show you this uh, on uh, referring to the multicellular composition of the heart. We know the adult heart consists of 30% contractile cardiomyocytes, but at least 70% of the cells are actually non-cardiomyocytes. So in those uh, non-cardiomyocytes, we have endothelial cells. We have epicardial-derived cells, so the epicardium is around the outside, an epithelial cell around the outside of the heart. And those epicardial cells can form cardiac fibroblasts, and we also have cardiac smooth muscle cells or pericytes in those uh, in those uh, structures. In the fetal heart, 60% of the heart is cardiomyocytes. So there's a switch as time goes by, and we don't know whether that um, makes a difference for the maturation or not. Now, what to those, uh, particularly the cardiac endothelium, what, it, what, it, what does it do? We know every single cardiomyocyte touches an endothelial cell. They form the uh, myocardial uh, vascul vasculature, which supplies oxygen and free fatty acids to the cardiomyocytes. It's their food. At the same time, there is a release of paracrine factors uh, from cardiomyocytes um, that uh, activate free fatty acid com uh, secretion by uh, the uh, vascular endothelial cells. And the paracrine factors from the endothelial cells regulate cardiac metabolism, survival, and contractile function. So there's a very intimate interaction between the cardiac um, endothelium and the cardiac, uh, cardiac myocytes. So we set out um, a little while ago to try and make cardiac endothelium specifically. And we developed um, a protocol in which we co-differentiate cardiomyocytes uh, and endothelial cells from um, IPS cells or ES cells, it doesn't matter. And we also managed to get a cardiac-specific um, endothelium. So we add VEGF or we add ZAF depending on which direction we want to go. And if we add both of them, we get a mixture of both cell types. And you can see uh, what this looks like. We can separate all these different cell types and remix them in different combinations, which we call microtissues. So you can see here in red, the endothelial cells. In green are the cardiomyocytes. So we make these mini microtissues. They're almost like organoids, but we call them uh, cardiac microtissues. And what you can see uh, here is how that differentiation uh, goes. So this is the CD31 staining, PCAM staining. In this case, it's GFP. So this is done with an embryonic stem cell line in which GFP has been targeted to the NKX2.5 locus. And you see here, 79% or well, nearly 80% of the cells are cardiomyocytes in this differentiation protocol. So that's a fairly high efficiency. And very few of these cells, uh, you can see that here, and a very few of these cells are uh, endothelial cells. But if we put in an endothelial differentiation protocol, adding VEGF, quite a large number are endothelial cells. And if we put it in the last protocol, getting both cell types, you can see both cardiac uh, myocytes and uh, endothelial cells. And what's interesting, if we look at these cells uh, separately, uh, and we uh, look at their expression of different markers what's very, and compare them with other sort of standard endothelial cells. We compare them with human aortic endothelial cells, venous endothelial cells, so HUVEX, that's a widely used endothelial cell, or human dermal blood endothelial cells. And we look at the expression of a whole bunch of genes. What we see is that the similarity between these cardiac endothelium we've derived from IPS cells or ES cells is very similar to that of primary endothelial cells from the heart. Um, you can see here that this endothelium actually expresses a number of cardiac transcription factors, which are um, uh, typical of uh, tissue-specific endothelium. And when we kind of look at these, uh, how these uh, tissues um, uh, react, I don't think this film's working, which is a 
pity, but this should show you how the micro tissues contract. And we can actually quantify this um, uh, to see how much the force of the contraction is. And now we have micro tissues. These are not embryoid bodies. These are specific cardiac micro tissues, and they only contain the cells of the heart. So my point is made that we need sometimes different uh, cell types. So let's say go back to 2007. What we did was very often what we call spontaneous differentiation in aggregates. Of course, we had mixed cell types, but there was very often an endodermal cell co component. So if we're trying to make heart cells, we might see them beating quite happily in the embryoid bodies, but they're not the right cellular composition. Then people tried for many years trying to make monotypic cell cultures to get a specific cell type of interest. Then we realized it might be better to have more complex structures, so we went back to making uh, these more organoid-like structures, and there are very many beautiful studies now sh making uh, gut organoids or brain organoids or eye organoids from iPS cells that contain both the epithelial components and the stromal components. And now we're even going a step further. We're deliberately trying to uh, introduce physical constraints, physical flow, and um, create organs on chip models. And you will see increasingly in the literature how this has developed. So for example, in the beginning, we had embryoid bodies. You can see that here. Uh, this was about, uh, these were mostly mixed cell populations. And in 2011, we got around to our peak of, of looking at monotypic cultures. Our differentiation protocols were getting very good. And you see there in the number of publications reporting on monotypic cultures was there at its peak. But if we look, uh, let's say, at the end of 2015, we're seeing a different trend. Of all the publications, only a third of them now are reporting on monotypic cultures. Um, quite a large number, another third, are reporting results on heterotypic cultures. So, for example, endothelial cells with heart cells or endothelial cells with kidney or with brain, whatever. And um, even a third are already reporting micro patterns, microfluidic, 2 and 3D micro tissues and organoids. So this shows how the trends are going in the area. Now, to talk specifically about the heart, how do we know what kind of cardiomyocytes we've got? Well, these are characterized by the electrophysiological characteristics, their action potentials. And you can see these here depicted for the different chambers of the heart. So at the bottom is ventricular, the uh, middle is uh, atrial, and the top is pacemaker-like action potentials. In our addition, uh, initial differentiation protocols, 85% of our cells were ventricular-like and showed this, uh, this type of action potential. 15% uh, of them were atrial-like and showed this action potential, and just 1% were pacemaker-like. So we wanted to know how we could direct differentiation to these different cell types. And I won't go into the details uh, here because all of the work's published. But basically, to get the ventricular cardiomyocytes, we go stepwise through all the different um, uh, stages of uh, development. We, we first make uh, mesoderm progenitors, precardiac mesoderm, cardiac mesoderm, heart field specific progenitors, finally beating ventricular cardiomyocytes. Each of those stages is marked with a specific transcription factor. And for many of these, we've now made reporter lines, which are efflorescent. So this has allowed us from the reporter lines to select out the cell populations of interest and identify cell surface markers. So for the NKX 2.5 GFP I showed you, by sorting those out, we found that they expressed the cell surface marker SERPA and VCAM. So if we now sort IPS uh, cells differentiating to cardiomyocytes for these two cell surface markers, we get a cell population in which 95% or more of the cells express NKX 2.5. So these reported lines have taught us a lot. To get the different, the different um, cell types, um, we've also managed to get uh, to form cardiac progenitors, and by uh, adding uh, retinoic acid um, at this particular stage here, we've been able to get atrial-specific uh, cardiomyocytes extremely well, 
And by adding other growth factors, including sonic hedgehog uh, and uh, TGF-beta signaling uh, inhibitor, we've been able to get uh, enriched populations of pacemaker cells that express the cell surface marker podoplanin, and we can sort these out. So this is basically how we've been able to get all the different subpopulations of the heart. So why are we uh, so bothered about getting uh, cardio, uh, human cardiomyocytes uh, for disease modeling? Well, I said earlier that the mouse heart beats at 500 times a minute and the human heart 60. And one of the reasons for this is their use of, uh, of different ion channels. So the mouse heart is smaller, it beats faster, and uses these different ion channels. Um, if you look particularly, let's say, at the sodium channel, the length of the arrows indicates uh, the size of the current going across the cardiomyocyte plasma membrane um, um, at a particular uh, in a particular channel. So you can see that the sodium channel uh, current is identical in mouse and humans. So if you were uh, a human with a mutation in that channel, you would also be able to see that same effect in a mouse. If you had a drug that hit that ion channel, you'd see the same effect in human and mouse. But if you look at the potassium channel, so this is um, an outward potassium channel, these are different. So if you get a mutation in that channel uh, as a human, you will have a long QT syndrome. If you have a mutation in the same ion channel in mouse, you will see nothing or very little. And the same is true for a drug that hits that channel. Now, that channel is extremely important in, in determining the arrhythmic uh, behavior of the cardiomyocyte. So here you see um, the ECG of a human. This is the electrocardiogram. And you see all these different peaks which correspond to when the different chambers uh, contract. So the QT interval determines uh, the, the behavior, the beating behavior of the heart, you could say. In the mouse, you can see the, uh, the, action, the uh, electrocardiogram is, is quite different, and the QT interval is also quite determined in a different way. You can see uh, also here, put on the same scale, the electrocardiogram is quite different in mouse and humans. Now, what we did was to look and see whether we could use human embryonic stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, as here, but it could also be iPS cells, putting them on a microelectrode array and measuring the external field potential. And you can see them beating away here. This is like an electrocardiogram of these cells. And you can see them beating here. So this is a, in a control situation. You see these very uh, regular beating uh, occurring here, measured by microelectrode array. If you add a drug, which is known to affect uh, heart rhythm, you can see here these peaks. The distance between them changes, and you get these funny little extra peaks, which are called early after depolarization. So in this model, we can actually measure the induction of cellular arrhythmias. And why that's important uh, is illustrated in this uh, study we did here. Um, we looked at the functional cell responses of in, in, in stem cell-derived heart cells at clinically relevant concentrations. We looked at two drugs, as you can see here. One is quinidine, and the other is sotalol, both of which are used to treat uh, heart patients to alter their QT interval deliberately. And what you can see is a flat curve with increasing concentrations along the y-axis. You see it's completely flat until we get an upturn at this point here, in which case uh, it's showing us that the microelectrode array is behaving differently. Now, if you look at this gray bar here, this is the concentration of quinidine as it would appear in the serum of patients. So we're getting clinically re relevant responses in our stem cell model. The same is true, true for this beta blocker, sotalol. You can see here the upturn of the curve in clinically relevant concentrations. Now, we tested a series of 12 uh, drugs using this type of assay um, that should affect the heart or should not, and we got all 12 of them correctly characterized just using this assay. And um, the pharmaceutical industry was quite interested, but they said that but you knew the outcome. You didn't do this blind. We'll give you 30 compounds and see if you can get them right in this uh, arrhythmia assay. And of those, we got 28 of them correct. So this included false positives in conventional assays. So 
the pharmaceutical company was surprised and pleased. But we weren't particularly because we're scientists. And we were very curious as to why two drugs that should have given us uh, an altered Mayo response actually didn't. So one of them is called J&J303, which is an IKS, a slow potassium channel blocker. And uh, we saw in the dose response curve it was flat, and we'd expected it to be upturned. But then we asked, what about the repolarization reserve? So there's, these cells have a certain reserve um, in them to repolarize. So we wondered what would happen if we inhibited the repolarization reserve by blocking, in part, the IKR. So that's the, one I, the channel I told you is not present or hardly present in mice. And this is what happened. When we partially blocked the IKR, we found the dose response curve we expected. So reduced repolarization reserve, increased drug responsivity and sensitivity. Is this relevant? Yes, it is. The prediction would be if we had an IPS cell line for a patient from a patient with a mutation in this IKR channel, they may be more sensitive. And these are exactly what we found. So working with Chris Denning in Nottingham, we derived patient iPS cells with an IKR mutation and did the same dose response curve. You can see at the bottom the healthy control, and here was the patient response. Increased responsiveness to this drug, J and J303, and also for this other drug which we'd missed in the original trial. And when we look back at the literature, this is exactly what you see. So looking at uh, long QT patients compared with control, this is their real ECGs, uh, the QT interval. Adding in sotolol, patients without long QT mutations uh, behaved normally before and after in their ECG, yet the group, the study group with a long QT mutation, you can see here that their QT interval uh, was altered. So they would be at had increased risk of sensitivity to uh, this extra drug. So this may be the reason that some patients have this sensitivity. Now, one of the important studies uh, we need to do is to be sure that the mutation we are observing is actually um, causing the phenotype. So we did a, a study here, again concentrating on long QT2, and we took the IPS uh, disease lines here and did, uh, corrected the gene to create an isogenic pair um, of, of these lines. At the same time, we took that uh, human embryonic stem cell line bearing the NKX2.5 reporter and introduced the same mutation into these cells. You can see that here. So these are two pairs of genetically matched uh, cell lines. And this should allow us to test the specificity of the mutation in causing the disease phenotype. Now, this is what we saw, that indeed, if we took the uh, LQ, uh, long QT2 uh, corrected line, which is the black line, um, sorry, the, 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 this is the, um, the black line, and if we uh, compared it with its disease uh, control, you can see here, that the control had a shortened action potential um, uh, if you measured this in the IPS cardiomyocytes. And likewise, if we take the uh, NKX 2.5 line, the normal line has a shorter action, action potential, introduce the mutation and get this, this shifting to the right, which is indicative of long QT. Now, this is fine. This looked great. But we had one worry. If you look at the actual values, the absolute values of the action potential duration, you can see um, that here it's much higher in the IPS cells than in the ES cells. So we thought this may be a difference between ES cells and IPS cells, or it may be particularly um, irrelevant. It may just be showing the range of values. And you can see that here. But first, um, we continued this study to figure out what the mechanism of uh, this mutation was. So this particular mutation um, was not known at the time uh, why these uh, patients had an arrhythmia. And because we had this uh, GFP-marked uh, mutant line, we could sort out on the basis of GFP the cardiomyocytes. And this allowed us to do a regular Western blot here um, for uh, this ion channel, which is the Herg channel. And what you can see here very clearly is that in the, the controls, 
you have uh, much of the uh, protein on the cell surface. This is the 156 KD protein. But in the uh, mutant line that you see much of it in the cytoplasm. So there's a, there's a reduction in the amount of protein on the cell surface um, and an increase in the cytoplasm. So for the first time, this was uh, discovered, the mechanism underlying this mutation was a, a protein trafficking defect. And this sort of illustrates how you can figure out the underlying mechanisms of disease. But I told you we were still puzzled by this difference in the basic action potential duration. So uh, Lucas Sala in the lab was uh, going to write a review. So I asked him to look in the literature the value, at the values of the action potential durations that have been reported. And then only in those papers in which the um, studies have been done under identical condition. So this is the action potential durations um, uh, he found in the literature. He found 19 studies in which everything that was apparently uh, identical. And you can see this whole range of basic um, action potential values. But if you, for example, look at, uh, let's say, uh, this one, which is um, a patient-derived line, and this one, with it, which is its isogenetic, uh, isogenically matched control, you can see um, that there's a difference. That's fine. But if you look at some of these commercial lines, you can buy cardiomyocytes, you can see several of these have exceptionally long action potential durations. So if you happen to use these as a control for, let's say, a disease line down here, you'd think you'd got short QT and not long QT. And it's because I was talking to people with this particular problem using um, a non-related control um, to, to assess their phenotype, it got very confusing. So be warned. You can see that uh, here, how, basically how you can use these cells um, as a model. So we've been looking for uh, allosteric compounds that can correct the mutation. We can see here we have um, a particular set of allosteric compounds. You can see them in, in this graph here and in this graph here. These compounds can shorten the QT interval, um, which uh, is, is exactly what they're supposed to do. But if you don't compare it with the right controls, you can see here there's a certain overlap. So we would have missed these compounds if we'd compared them to the wrong uh, cell type. Yet, if you look at the literature again, you see that many studies, this is the number of publications here, and you can see over time, most studies only use unrelated uh, control cell lines. There are some studies that use uh, a family member as a control. These are shown in red. And there are very few studies still that actually use in green the isogenic pair. And you can see with this range of values, this is absolutely essential if possible. Otherwise, you have to take a lot more control lines. And this is not true, just true of cardiomyocytes. It's true of almost every cell type, which is why we, why we as a journal for stem cell reports, ask apparently for many different uh, controls unless there's an isogenically matched pair. To jump now to uh, maturation, could we get uh, maturation? Uh, we can't get maturation fully yet, but nevertheless, it's certainly worth trying. And one of the things we tried is to look at the metabolic conditions under which the cells grow. And this is a study uh, we, uh, in which we looked at the number of mitochondria in the cardiomyocytes as a measure of maturation. So a mature cardiomyocyte uses an awful lot of energy, and that comes mostly from the mitochondria. So as differentiation um, takes place and maturation takes place, the number of mitochondria in uh, a cardiomyocyte will increase. So we did here a very kind of rough assay. We used the NKX 2.5 GFP human embryonic stem cell again and induced them to form cardiomyocytes. This GFP is um, a cytoplasmic GFP. It's not nuclear localized. So it gives you a very sort of rough um, indication of cell volume. We also labeled, uh, loaded the mitochondria with a dye such that the mitochondria were full. So the ratio of these two dyes, these two uh, fluorescent dyes, gave us a rough measure of the mitochondrial to cell volume ratio, which allowed us to see when that goes up, 
whether there were more uh, mitochondria or more, um, more present, and, uh, which would be an indication of maturation. And when we added in a bunch of factors, we added in T3, the hormone, IGF-1, and dexamethasone, all relevant around birth, we saw here that the relative fluorescent values were significantly increased uh, above control or any of these compounds uh, individually. So we got some degree of mat metabolic maturation. And accompanying that, we also saw that the action potentials increased. So this is with the vehicle control. And you can see here, the resting membrane potential has gone down if we add these factors uh, here, um, which is an indication of maturation. And the upstroke uh, velocity and size has also gone up, also an indication of maturation. You can see it's quantified here. So um, what about uh, looking at cells under these conditions? What we've done is uh, develop methods in which we can measure uh, contraction. We, look, we plate the single cells onto a polymer substrate, which they like to sit on, and they can contract. We uh, load them with uh, either calcium or an action potential dye, and we put uh, fluorescent beads into the fluorescent substrate. So we can measure contraction indirectly as uh, how these beads actually move. Um, and what that allows us to do is to measure voltage, calcium transient, and contraction simultaneously in single cells. So you can see uh, in this, this right-hand graph, you can see the first uh, line is the upstroke of the action potential. The next uh, is the calcium transient. And the third is the contraction. And what you would expect if you, let's say, would have a, a drug or a mutation that altered the contraction, you might see that the contraction would shift. Now, this is a theoretical uh, yeah, uh, the way uh, you would expect to see it. But actually, in practice, you really do see it. So when we use this three-parameter system, you can see here on the right these three parameters, voltage, calcium transient, and contraction under control conditions. And if we add the drug digoxin, you can see here, just as expected, the calcium uh, transient goes up and the contraction force goes up significantly without affecting the action potential. So this is a way of screening for drugs, but using uh, these three parameters simultaneously. And in this context, we're part of an international consortium called CRACKIT, which is supported by GSK and the NC3R, which is a UK organization for animal alternatives, trying to see whether this uh, is predictive um, of um, uh, drug responses. So we've tested now 10 compounds uh, unblinded in this type of assay and are currently um, testing another 20 blinded, and at the end of the journey, we will have these unblinded to see whether we could predict. And this is um, headed by uh, Chris Denning in the UK, but Thomas Eschenhagen and Godfrey Smith's uh, group are part of this, along with a couple of companies, um, comparing head-to-head -head different types of cardiomyocytes, different sources, also in um, uh, engineered heart tissues to see which is the best kind of outcome, which is the most predictive. But our particular maturation assay has been particularly useful for us because when we looked at the contraction under these uh, metabolically enhanced conditions, we found that the force of contraction was significantly increased in these single uh, myocytes under these conditions. And this allowed us to reveal a phenotype in uh, patients, uh, iPS cells, which had a mutation in the myosin binding protein C3 gene. These uh, patients have uh, heart failure. And what you see here is the cardiomyocytes from iPS cells from three patients with this condition. So you see this reduced force of contraction caused by this particular mutation. This um, uh, these particular patients, one of them was a boy of 14 who collapsed on the football field near our hospital and was re reanimated. We made his iPS cells. Turned out he had this mutation. He didn't know about it. His father has the same mutation. 
um, and he didn't know about it either, and this was an unrelated control. Now, if we took our standard conditions, the force of contraction was so low, there's no way we could see a reduction in the, in the force of contraction. And by using these uh, enhanced maturation conditions, we could. We could also see this under these conditions with an siRNA knockdown you can see here. So what about the physical constraints? Well, we're not there yet on these uh, kind of uh, models. What we're developing with the technical universities, uh, Technical University of Delft and, and uh, Philips, is a heart-on-a-chip model. So this uh, is, a, is indicated here. It's um, a microelectrode array in which uh, the, it's built into a polymer substrate, so the, the whole chip will actually oscillate with a vacuum pressure at 60 or 120 or 80 times, 180 times a minute. We expect we can uh, model genetic forms of heart failure much better this, and maybe also things like myocardial infarction, lack of oxygen. You can see it uh, oscillating now. And what we can also do is make vessels on the chip. So these are microfluidic vessels. You can see here if we uh, have a constriction in one of these, uh, these tubes and we flow blood through, you can actually get a blood clot forming on the downside of the constriction. So this is actually a kind of model for um, uh, atherosclerosis and thrombosis. We can mimic the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we can probably mimic uh, vasculitis and vascular dementia if we put inflammatory cells in. So this is the kind of complex model um, we all move, many of us are moving towards these days. So what's the future of human pluripotent stem cells in disease modeling and drug discovery? If we look forward, I think um, isogenic human pluripotent stem cells with human disease relevant mutations will be widely available. If, those, if there are people interested in, in doing this, there are many, many banks now coming online with different combinations of, of these, drug, uh, of these uh, cell lines. CIRM has one, the New York Stem Cell Foundation has one, there are several in the UK, the Wellcome Trust has one, there's something called ECAC, there is uh, Coriel has different uh, cell lines. And many of these have um, the proper informed consent, so not just for academics to work with them, but also companies. Most academics realize that they're never going to discover a drug. We need to collaborate with companies to do these drug screens and doing it with robotics. Many of these lines will have the genome sequence uh, um, information, so any of those with the EMBL, uh, EBI um, consortium in, in Hingston, many of these have whole genome sequences uh, associated with them. The donor medical history will likely be available, and it's likely would know, in many cases, the drug responses. This is all a building resource, and it's, it's something already being done. The most among the most exciting things, I think, is this could provide missing link for genome-wide association studies through precision genetic engineering. Precision en genetic engineering is now getting so uh, efficient with CRISPR-Cas and its modifications that we're beginning to be able to uh, modify single, uh, introduce single SNPs upstream of genes, not just large mutations or various mutations, but real subtle uh, differences in the genome. And uh, whether we can detect the effect of these uh, small changes in DNA is going to depend on the quality of our assays and our state of maturation. So there's a lot, lot to be done, but a, this is the only way to actually prove cause and effect of genome-wide association data. We can't do it in mice. It will be possible to test drug combinations at different doses for their effectiveness and toxicity in patients. Dr patients take many, many different uh, drugs, um, and it, will, it isn't possible to test all of these simultaneously in animals at different doses. iPS cells or um, pluripotent stem cells in general in different combinations could allow us to test all the different types of drugs a patient might take and maybe re reveal enhanced sensitivities, as I showed you in one example. And high throughput bioassays, including organs on chip and 3D formats, will become available online to develop new drug treatments that delay or reverse symptoms of disease. 
In many cases, delaying the symptoms, let's say delaying heart failure, but also delaying ALS or any kind of neural condition is always going to be better than reversing symptoms once all the cells have been destroyed. Cell therapy is always the route of second choice and um, organ transplantation is perhaps the route of third choice when it um, could perhaps be the other way around if we can prevent symptoms developing as quickly um, as they do. So I'm going to finish now. Uh, the work I've uh, described, uh, most of it's published, and the people involved in this are our junior PIs uh, in the department and uh, also our IPS core facility that makes our lines and helps us um, do the genetic repair. These are the many students and postdocs uh, that have or are involved, have been or are involved, and of course we have many collaborators. Not all are listed here. And we wouldn't do any of it without external funding, which are listed at the bottom. Thank you. Christine, thank you very much for that really elegant presentation. Um, with that, I would just like to remind the audience that they have the opportunity to submit any questions in the Q&A box in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Um, and in the last few minutes now, we will uh, start to answer a couple of the questions that we've seen coming in. So Christine, if I may, I'd just like to start with um, one question here that's in relation to generating the IPS. Mm -hmm. uh, Disease-relevant IPSCs can be generated by reprogramming somatic tissues obtained from diseased patients or by editing the genome of healthy control IPSCs to introduce disease-relevant mutations. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the advantages, disadvantages of each approach, and is one approach better than the other? Well, to start with the second part, um, there isn't one approach better than the other. They, they teach us different things. So by using um, a standard cell line, uh, you will probably know a lot in advance about the properties of the cell types, the cell type coming out of that standard line. So you will have a very strong baseline of it, data that if you introduce a mutation or a SNP or a variant, you will very easily see uh, a deviation from your wealth of data. You've probably done an experiment on that line 50 or 100 times. So that's easy to see. But what that approach doesn't capture is genetic variability. It doesn't um, capture any kind of predisposition in the genome for particular uh, conditions. It doesn't capture ethnic differences either. So uh, many people know that um, some mutations affect certain ethnic groups more than others. S certain drugs affect um, uh, of certain ethnic groups more than others. And so there is the wish to um, embrace this individual uh, type of genome um, to get really personalized medicine. So uh, they have uh, ups and downs, both of them. As you see, we, we use both. Um, the ideal IPS cell may be one derived from somebody older because at least they would have been proven to have a healthy life up to the age that the IPS cell has uh, been derived, whereas if you derive it from somebody very young, you never know what they're going to develop as they get older. So swings and roundabouts, but ideally one perhaps would do both to be really sure um, what your, your mutation is, is giving rise to. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, we have another question as well, Christine. Um, you touched on genomic integrity of cultured IPS lines as being a challenge to using IPSCs. Um, how do you control for genomic integrity in your work? What do you recommend others should do? And how often you, should you make such assessments? Yeah, that, that's a very difficult question because we don't really know either. Um, so there, of course, carrier typing was for years the golden sort of standard. You looked at your carrier type, you, you looked at, let's say, 20 cells, and if it was normal, it was fine. Um, and you looked at them preferably once a month, but most people found it too expensive to do it once every two months or something like that. Um, it, it's turned out that this might not be the uh, easiest way to go, the most informative. Um, what we are now using, also because it's very expensive, in our case, we have to pay something like 500 uh, euros a go, uh, so if you've got uh, lots of clones from different lines, it's really, really expensive. So we're now using a sort of PCR approach and are exploring 
uh, new ones. So one of them is a method described by Peter Andrews, a PCR-based approach, which looks fairly good to us. Um, we're also, I believe, exploring one from Thermo Fisher, although I'm perhaps not supposed to say that, um, but that's also uh, looking perhaps an interesting way to go. So uh, okay, I wouldn't have much. a recommendation. Uh, have a further... Sorry. Okay. I wouldn't have a firm recommendation. Um, I have a further question here. Um, do, you think the, I, do you think the IPSC disease models and controls that you have described could be applied to multigenic or complex diseases? Uh, are there any examples in your work? Um, yes. So um, we, are make, we are looking at IPS uh, lines from uh, consanguinic families, so where uh, the mother has one mutation, the father another, neither of them have a phenotype, but their children do because they inherit both. So uh, what we're doing is combinations of putting the mother's mutation in the father's IPS um, and seeing whether we get the phenotype of the children. So yes, we are. Um, but I think there's a, a lot to be done in that area, looking at um, multiple uh, genes, uh, and particularly in those, those circumstances, if you want to relate it to a real family, yes, I think there's lots of opportunities there. And not just in the heart, okay, as you. we happen to Actually, focus on, but of course many diseases. So I'd like to uh, thank the audience uh, who were there. Uh, we saw we, quite a lot of people uh, were interested. Um, I think the pro program is now uh, finished. Thank you for listening. <laughs>